So glad all of you could be here tonight. Been an amazing turnout this week. Passion Week here at Calvary Chapel Golden Springs. If you're here for the first time, maybe you've been invited by someone, I want to welcome you to the church. And I want to thank you for coming, being a part of our church community here. If not nothing, just for today, or maybe God is going to bring you back for another day. We have this rest of the week coming up. Tomorrow night, Scott will be here. Friday night, Pastor Raw will be here for Good Friday service. Saturday, we wait. Sunday, he has, he has risen. And Pastor Raw will be here for four services at 6 a.m., 8, 10, and 12. I pray you're here for that very first one. A lot of people say, said that you wouldn't get up that early. But I'm challenging you to get up early and be here at 6 a.m. on Sunday morning and watch the sunrise. And this is that time of year when you will watch the sunrise if you get here at 6 a.m. No more beautiful feeling in the world to be in church on the resurrection day. So I pray you can all be here. You know... Uh, Pastor Rawl and his wife Sharon have been such an important part of my life and such an important part of what you see around you. I'm, I'm so privileged to say that I was around at the very beginning when we were meeting in each other's homes back in the 70s. I know I don't look that old, but, <laughs> but I am that old. And to see what God has done, my heart is warmed right now, just to see what God has done and what he continues to do. And I pray you realize you're part of a vibrant church. And if you're not going to a church, please, you're welcome here. And we ask you to come back. I would like to start this morning in a word of prayer and the reading of God's word. So if you would, please, could you stand right now? Just stand. I'm here tonight to share with you the fourth message of our week of passion, the passion of Christ, the suffering of Christ, the pain of Christ that is yet to come. Now, when we gather together today, we'll be studying the anointing at Bethany, one of the most beautiful messages in the Bible, a time that we can remember always how God moved in a woman's life through utter and extravagant ways. He moved her to a point of devotion and love and charity. She gave everything she could for her Lord and for her Savior. And we're going to watch this evening. We're going to watch. We're going to watch. I, I, I believe we watch as the Spirit would move among us. And I pray that tonight, if you've come with any heavy burdens or any difficulties, struggles in your life, challenges that you're having difficulty getting through, questions perhaps in your mind without answers, but you believe, you trust in the Lord, and you're here to wait upon him now. Well, be still and know that he is God. And through the message, I pray it would be all of him and none of me. I pray that his word touches your heart tonight. And so we'll start with the reading of the word of God. I'm going to read out of the gospel of Mark, the 14th chapter. Beginning with the first verse. After two days, it was the Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might take Christ by trickery and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask 
and poured it on his head. But some there were indignant and said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Let us pray. Father, we have heard your word, your inerrant word, your everlasting word, your life-giving word, your rest-giving word, Your word that never fails. Your word that we trust in has entered into our ears and into our heart and into our mind. May you speak to us through your word. May you bless us tonight, Father, as we come before you. May this entire week, Lord, be brought together each and every night. And speak to us, Lord, of this great week, this great moment in time. I ask, Lord, your blessing upon this place and upon these people and meet them where they are, Father. Meet each and every one where they are in their life right now, Father. Those who are calling upon your name, those who are taking this time seriously, those who are looking to you, Father, for rest and peace and comfort and forgiveness, for answers, for strength, for forgiveness. Lord, as we wait upon you now, may our ears be ears that would hear. May we have ears to hear as the Spirit would speak to us. Bless those who are listening in, Father, through the Internet. Bless our pastor, Lord, who is with his wife as she waits patiently upon you, Lord. I pray for lengthened days of life. I pray that you strengthen her body, her mind, her heart, her soul. Let's just speak to her, Father, words of comfort and peace and promise. Bless her tonight, Lord. I know they're watching, and I know they're listening. May you fill them, Father, and fill this place, Lord. We love you, and we thank you, and we ask these things in Jesus' most holy name, and together we said, amen. You may be seated. Please take a seat at this time. I read the words of math, uh, uh, the Gospel of Mark, and we, we know this to be as the anointing at Bethany. You can find this same message in Matthew chapter 26, verse 6 through 13, and in John the Gospel, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. There's another place in the Bible where you'll see an anointing, but it is the one that you find in the Gospel of Luke, different than this. I just wanted to clarify that from the beginning. What we see here in this message is probably one of the most beautiful characters that you'll recognize in the Bible. That's the character of Mary. 
It's not the main character in the story. That'd be God. God is the main character. His presence is going to see, be seen from the very beginning to the very end. We're going to see how God works miraculously and mysteriously and wonderfully through the most difficult of times. And surely it was a difficult time. When Pastor Raw was teaching on Sunday, he thought of the triumphant entry of Christ. Probably the second most important day in a Christian's life when Christ entered into Jerusalem, marking that moment in prophecy that Zechariah spoke of as Christ would come riding on the foal of an ass. That the people would be cheering him on. Jerusalem was going crazy. The very first book, the very verse, first verse talks about the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Two days until the Passover, which would be on Friday. Today it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Something is taking place on Wednesday that changes everything in regards to this week of passion. We've seen so far the triumphant entry. Then we saw, as Sean would teach, on Monday, the cleansing. And the argument that Wade spoke of, the argument of Christ, the, uh, Wade spoke of yesterday. These, these verses drawing us to the attention that this was the presentation of Christ into the Passion Week. Looking forward, moving now towards the cross of Jesus Christ. Tonight we open up under the shadow of the cross. The messages will change from this point on. We are now going to prepare Christ tonight for his burial, for his death, for his torment. It's a wonderful story, though. It's a, it's a message of great hope. It's a great message of great promise. And it's a message for each and every one of us. After two days, it was the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. The chief priests and the scribes sought now how they might take Jesus by trickery. Verse 1, verse 2 and put him to death. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. Listen, this is the Passover that's taking place. The whole, the whole picture of Jerusalem is changing in, in, in this very short period of time. What is going on? This is, listen, this is one of the most important feasts of the Jewish people, of the Israelite. This is it. This is the time when they commemorate what took place in the book of Exodus when they were being held captive by the Egyptians, held in, in, in captivity as slaves, and they were, they, they were being oppressed, and God said it was time for them to be released, and Pharaoh would not let them go, and God raised up Moses, and, and Moses would present to Pharaoh the... the the plagues that were on the way, 10 plagues would come before Pharaoh would let Israel go. And there they were on the 10th plague. And the 10th plague was the plague of death. The promise of death for, to the firstborn of Israel or the firstborn of Egypt, anyone in Egypt. And Pharaoh would not relent. And he held on. And the Lord would come. But the Lord spoke to the people of God. And he said, if you take a lamb, and a spotless lamb, and if you slaughter that lamb, and if you take the blood, and you put it on the post of the door, then when I come, I will pass over your household. And you will be saved. Oh, the picture becomes clearer and clearer, doesn't it? It foreshadows the time that Christ would go to the cross. 
that he would be nailed to that cross and the blood on the cross would cause death to pass over us. Because when we believe in Jesus Christ, we don't die. We are given eternal life. I think it's ironic. They were celebrating in the city of Jerusalem this great moment that God would save their people. But at the same time, they were conniving. They were getting together to trick the people into believing that Jesus was worthy of death how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. And who were they putting to death? John the Baptist would say about Jesus, here he is. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the earth. But because of their hatred, because of their jealousy, because of their anger towards Jesus Christ, Father, forgive them. They didn't know what they were doing. I pity the world today that mocks Jesus. I really do. I know all of you are sitting here on a Wednesday night, but the majority of people in your neighborhoods are watching something on TV. They're paying no attention to the week. They're not looking at each and every day as a day that we meet together here because each day has something to say in regards to the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the most important event in our lives. But they put it on hold. They think that they have so much in control here, don't they? They're getting together. They're conspiring to have Jesus put to death. And then they say, well, you know what? We're even going to not do it now because of the riot that might occur. You see at Jerusalem in this time. There was about, Jerusalem in itself was a very bustling city. It was a busy city. There, it was a city of about 250,000. But during the Passover, it was required that every Jew within 15 miles of Jerusalem would come into Jerusalem for the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Eight days. The Passover would be on Friday and then seven days of celebration of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Because when they were leaving, there would be this sense, sense, such a sense of urgency to get out of Egypt that they could not put leaven in the bread. They were told, don't put any leaven in the bread. There's no time for the raising of the, the yeast in the bread. No, we will eat matzah. We will eat bread without leaven. And for seven days, the celebration continues. I, I think it's quite important that we recognize this first observation. The scribes, well, the, 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 the priests, the Sanhedrin, the elders who wanted to get rid of Jesus thought they had it under control. There's two things that I think are very important in your life, and that is to understand there's nothing with, with greater strength than the providence of God and the sovereignty of God. What does that mean? That means that God has this. God has it. The world might think they can stop what we believe in. The, the world might think they can cause us to not do something or to, to stop us from worshiping God in some way, shape, or form. But can they? What God said will happen is going to happen. They said they wouldn't do anything because it was ta the time of the Passover and the celebration of unleavened bread. But I'll tell you, when was Christ crucified? On the day of the Passover. They said they wouldn't, but God said they would. And he did. Now, there's some characters in this passage that I want you to pay attention to. There are, there, 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 there's going to be three of them that, that we will we'll take a moment to, to reflect upon. It's going to take place in the city of Bethany. 
in the town of Bethany, I should say, a small town, not a large town. It was only about two miles away from Jerusalem. You can see it from the, from the place of Bethany. We've been there often. The Mount of Olives, it's at the foot of the Mount of Olives. It's a place that is remembered in the Bible. It's a place where Lazarus would be raised from the dead with his uh, sisters Mary and Martha at his side. It was the place where God would one day return. Jesus would return. In Zechariah 14.4 it says on that day, the feet of Jesus shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east at the foot of the Mount of Olives is Bethany. And when Jesus returns to set up his kingdom, it will be on this very place that he left, the Mount of Olives near Bethany. And I would add this, that oh, Beth, even though Bethany may be small and rather insignificant because it was, it will be the scene of a world-changing event, the glorious return of Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords, Revelation 19. It was in Bethany. Bethany would be crowded at this time also. 250,000 people lived in Jerusalem, but during the time of the Passover, Passover 2.5 million people show up. Jesus was in Bethany before he would enter into Jerusalem on the day of his triumph, triumphant entry. So important. And being at Bethany, at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. At the house of Simon the leper, present, Mary. Now, the book of Mark doesn't give us a name. It's just woman. But John, in the Gospel of John, in the 12th chapter, he tells us her name. Her name is Mary, Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha, the sister of Lazarus. I think it's important also that we know the name of Bethany means the house of figs, but it also means the house of affliction, the house of poverty. Jerusalem names, means the house of peace. There was no room for Jesus and the apostles in Jerusalem, but they had an invite in Bethany. Simon the leper. If he wasn't a leper anymore, they wouldn't be in that house, I guarantee you. To have leprosy in the time of Christ would mean you suffered from an incurable disease. And it was a horrible disease. It would eat away at the, at the flesh. Simon, the leper, was healed by Jesus, I'm sure. A friend of Jesus. Lazarus was a friend of Jesus also. And we know that in the Gospel of John, in the 11th chapter, we can pick up a, another time when Mary and Martha were present, and Lazarus was present. In Bethany, a place of affliction, Lazarus was dying, and the sisters, Mary and Martha, had called out, letting, they wanted Jesus to know that their brother, Lazarus, was dying, and he was loved by Jesus, and come quickly, And when Jesus got there, she, they were crying for their brother had died and was in the grave. And both Mary and Martha questioned Jesus, where were you? I, I, I say this so that you can gather the heart of, Je, uh, of Mary into your mind. 
Where were you, Jesus? The, the, the shortest verse in the Bible shows up there. Jesus wept. His heart was broken for what was going on when he got there, but it was as a matter of not truly understanding who he was. He said, I am the resurrection and the life to Martha. Do you know that if you believe in me, even though you shall die, you shall not die, you shall live forever? And then Jesus, Jesus would question them. Do you believe this? Now, I stand here this, this evening and, and I ask you the very same question. It's one thing to hear the word of God, but it's a whole other thing to believe the word of God. You might ask yourself the same questions that the opposition would ask themselves as Mary would take this flask this alabaster flask. And she takes this flask and she breaks off the neck of it. Jesus and the disciples were there. There was probably at least 16 people there in the house of Simon the leper. There would have been Jesus. There would have been Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And there would have been the 12 apostles. And I don't know if Simon the leper had a wife and children. But they were there. They were there to fulfill the providence of God. Things were changing now. There was a sense of urgency. Just like a... In Egypt, the sense of urgency to leave. God gives us the ability to sense the, the, the voice of God in our life, the discerning heart, knowing it's time. Mary knew it was time. Her relationship with Jesus caused her to have that discerning Mind, that discerning heart. Something is happening. Something is going to happen. Maybe she had heard the message of Jesus to the disciples that they didn't fully understand. When you read this passage in the Gospel of Matthew, in the 26th chapter, he, it, it says there, as Matthew would, would write, that Jesus spoke to the disciples. And just before this narrative that we're picking up on now, he said that I am headed into Jerusalem. When I get to Jerusalem, I will be crucified. I didn't see then the, the urgency in the, in the hearts, the minds, and the lives of the, of the apostles. But I would say that this, Mary saw something happening. Mary, this, Mary had no name in the, in the gospel of Mark and in the gospel of Matthew, but in the gospel of John is given us a name, Mary of Bethany. The same Mary of Bethany who would sit at the feet of Jesus and listen while Martha worked, and you remember that message? Martha would complain to Jesus, I'm working like crazy to take care of everything, and there my sister Mary is sitting at your feet. He says, I know. In Luke 10, 38 through 42. I know she's sitting at my feet. And Jesus would tell Martha in, in, in that passage that she is choosing the better thing. She is learning of the Lord. And this thing would not be taken from her. What, is, what does Jesus want of us? What, what, what do I need to do to have this heart of Mary who, who's going to do something that we'll see right now that is going to be just so unbelievably 
beautiful. I pray everybody in this room would want to do something. This whole message is about wanting to do something. Now now the Bible tells me that as Jesus was leaning back because they reclined at the table where they would eat, the meal was over, he's leaning back. And out of nowhere, a woman came. Verse 3, out of nowhere, a woman came having an alabaster flask. And that alabaster flask was filled with very costly oil of spark of spikenard. The flask itself was expensive, and it was made into the shape of a, of, 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 of a bottle with a very thin neck. And some of you ladies know that, that that thin neck would not allow a lot of the oil to come out, but maybe just a dab on the finger, just to coat the finger. And, 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 and you know the more expensive the perfume. This was perfume, ladies. This wasn't, uh, and, and forgive me if I get it wrong, I'm not, this wasn't deodorant. This wasn't toilet water. This, this wasn't the cheap stuff. You can buy the cheap stuff. You know, I, I've, I've gone to my, I remember making a big mistake one time. I went to the May Company. And some are laughing because May Company is out of the question. But went, went, to, went into the May Company. My wife said, oh, I like this particular uh, name brand of perfume. And so when I went, Hey, I'm just a guy, and I'm looking on the shelf, and I see a a real small bottle, one ounce. One ounce was unbelievably expensive. But then I saw the same name. Oh, yeah, the same name. And it was like a, a fourth of the price. And then I looked further down, and they had it in a spray bottle. And they were practically a big old bottle. And I asked the lady, what's the difference? And she's had this conversation before. She, this for your wife's anniversary? I said, yeah. She said, forget these. Let's go to the small bottle and I'll tell you about that and why it's so expensive. And ladies, you know, why is that small bottle so expensive? It's pure It's undiluted. And it lasts. And it's got a very small opening. And you just take a a dab and you put it and you can smell it a mile away. The fragrance is so strong, undiluted. Well, this is the spike nard. Undiluted spike nard. Pure spike nard. It was taken from India, northern India, in the Himalayas to get it to Jerusalem. Made it so expensive. But she didn't have a small amount. She had a large jar. It was a Roman litra, about 12 ounces. Now, I I just want to take a moment, and maybe we need to hesitate for a second. It was customary that they would take a, 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 just a dab at times to put on people as they came into their house. It, it, it was a hospitable thing to do. It, you know, back then, they didn't have showers in the houses. They didn't even have bathtubs in the houses. They didn't have deodorant. And on a hot and humid day, you could imagine. And they would take this oil just as a custom and and put it on their loved ones. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. But there Mary sees Jesus. Her sense of urgency takes over. She had heard he was going to die. And she just takes the bottle and breaks off that thin opening. Why? 
because my Jesus is going to get it all. And she starts at the head. And she begins to pour the oil over our Lord and Savior's head, anointing his body. The Bible says anointing his body for burial. In the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter, it says that she would anoint his feet and then she would wipe it with her hair. Why? What was going through her mind? I I not only want to give to my Lord and Savior something very, very special that nobody else was going to do. But I want to be a part of it. I want that fragrance that is now filling the room to be a part of me. Let me tell you, it's not good enough that you just give something to Jesus He wants your life. Maybe this is why Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I want to know how Christ lived. I want to know how Christ behaved. I want to know how Christ acted. I want to know how Christ loved. I want to know how Christ forgave. I want people to smell the fragrance of Christ upon me. Do you look like Christ? Do you have the fragrance of Christ? Poured on his head. But there's a response to this in verse 4. There's a response. But there were some who were indignant among themselves. And said, why is this fragrant oil wasted? I got to stop there. Those who were indignant. Once again, John, the author of John, John the beloved, the author of the gospel of John, tells us who is speaking. It was Judas. Judas Iscariot. Judas who would betray Christ. He's the spokesperson. But the 12 were were among them. They weren't arguing with him. He was speaking some sense of truth. He said, this perfume that you're using, lady, don't you know how expensive it is? What can be done with it? How many poor can be fed with it? John the Beloved said, yeah, he's saying that because he's a thief. And he wants to sell that oil to get the money so that he could steal some more from Jesus. That money that had been received from poor people. That the disciples might eat. Judas wanted it for himself. Wasted, he said. Wasted? I wrote this next to my Bible. Can anything we do for Jesus ever be wasted? If you do something for Jesus, it is never wasted. But their response, and and the Bible says that this response of theirs was not only indignant, it was something they criticized her with sharply. They were angry. Those words criticized sharply were the same words used to to describe a, 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 a... a wild bull whose nostrils would widen. And they came after her in a horrible manner. 
criticizing her for doing something to Jesus that they should have done? Why didn't they see, see the urgency in it? Why, why didn't they see the necessity of it? Why didn't they spend more, more time at the feet of Jesus like Mary? People know your Lord, know your Savior. It is impossible for you to do anything great for God until you have suffered with him a while. He's with you. He knows you. And he wants to use you. He was about to use Mary in a tremendous way. Wasted is what they said. And then thank God that Jesus was there. They had become indi indi indignant. They said, why was this fragrant oil wasted? It might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. Is, is, is it an amazing? Some, some of you have done some, probably some pretty or, out of the ordinary things for your love of Christ and were criticized for it. And you know the feeling. Maybe you, you've even questioned yourself. You've given something, you've done something, and you did it for Jesus. And someone made you feel, made you feel awkward. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. You have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have. You do not have me always. She had done a good work for him. I wrote down three things to remember. Three things that I think we would learn from the life of Mary. Jesus simply said, she has done a good work for me. Have you done a good work for the Lord lately? What was the good work she did? Well, we know that she anointed his head, his body, his feet, his legs. But Jesus said this. In the sixth verse, he said, she has done a good work for me. In verse eight, that good work included this. She has done what she could. If you would, I underline it just for future reference. She has done what she could. She was in that room. For a woman to enter in now. Among men who were speaking might have been difficult. But she just did it because she could. She didn't ask anybody's permission. She just did it. She didn't explain what she, what she was going to do. She just did it. She did it without looking for approval. She just did it. She did it. Why? Because she could. Sometimes we hesitate to do something because we think we can't. But Jesus just lifted the pressure off of our backs. When I read this, he just realized, I just began to realize, listen, there's so much I could do, but there's so much I don't do because I think I can't do it. 
Jesus has just told Mary or spoke of Mary and gave me a great lesson in my life. She did what she could. And Dale, you need to do what you can. And don't worry and don't fret over the things you can't do because Jesus will never ask you to do something that you can't do. If he speaks to your heart to do it, you do it. The words of Christ take the pressure out of the equation. I wrote to myself, the world is filled with tremendous needs. Our heart breaks for the things we want to do, but we can't do, so we don't do. But Jesus calls us to look into the mirror and do what you can do, but just do it. Mary did what she could do, and so can we. And the rest of things, of the things that need to be done, he will do. Uh, we, we are so frustrated sometimes. What else did Mary do for the Lord? She prepared him for burial. In two days, Christ would be crucified. There would be no time for preparation then. God spoke to her and said, now break that flask of oil and pour it over his head and watch it drip off of his hair and onto his back and, 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 and across his legs and then anoint his feet. And I thought about this. She prepared him. This is the moment of preparation for, for the great passion, the great pain and the great suffering. She anoints his head, and, and as the oil is being poured over his head, I can only think that is the head that is being prepared for the crown of thorns that will be pushed down upon it. And as the oil is going down his back, I'm thinking he is being prepared for the whip, the cat of nine tails that has nine straps attached to it and on each strap embedded with metal and bones and stones and glass, anything they could find that would tear into the flesh of Jesus and pull the skin completely off. His back was being anointed for the lash. His legs would be anointed and his legs would be necessary to carry that cross, wouldn't they? And at one point they would buckle, but until they buckled, Jesus carried the cross that would be necessary for his crucifixion and he was being prepared. His feet that walked the Via Dolorosa. The way to the cross, the way to Calvary, the way to Golgotha, the way to his death. Thank God for Mary. Thank God for her obedience to the voice of God. Thank God for her willingness to give all that she has. Thank God for the memory that we have of what she has done. And that leads me to the third thing that she did for Jesus. Her life was a memorial. She left an everlasting memorial. This is what Jesus said. I assuredly, in verse 9, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And here we are tonight, the 27th of March, 2024. Two, almost 2,000 years after it took place. And what are we doing? I'm going to read to you something that Charles Spurgeon wrote. 
And I'm going to end it with this. And now my prayer is that we may be endowed with this, and endued this morning with the same spirit as that which prompted the woman when she broke her alabaster box upon the head of Christ. There must be something wonderful about this story, or else Christ would not have linked it with his gospel. For so has he done. So long as this gospel lives, shall this story of the woman be told. And when this story of the woman ceases to exist, then the gospel must cease to exist also. For they are co-eternal. As long as this gospel is preached and wherever it is proclaimed, the story of this woman is to go with it. Our Lord's prediction goes on to be verified while the memorial of this woman fills the church with its fragrance. There must be something therefore remarkable in it. Let us pause and look and learn. And God give us grace to imitate. What will we do with the message tonight? What takes place now? Shall we just leave this place and wait for tomorrow and the next message and the next message and the next message? Or does the word of God become alive now in my life? Will I be willing to step out and do what I could do and not worry about the things that I can't do that hinder me from doing the things that I could do? Will I have a sense of urgency knowing that I have heard the word of God and that his coming is imminent? All of this week we are looking forward to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we are in a moment of time right now where if you look around as in the days of Noah when the destruction of this world came about because of the disobedience of mankind and the hatred of one another, the disregard for marriage, the immorality that was being wiped out. And they didn't pay attention. And the flood came. People, I leave you with a sense of urgency. Have, have urgency in your heart. Maybe if you're here tonight and you've listened and you've seen the work of Mary take place. You've seen the opposition that works against you when you do good for God. But God is on your side. You don't need to defend yourself because God is your defense. Jesus was her defense. Jesus is your defense tonight. But your heart is pounding. You're believing. Your eyes are opening. And you know, you know you've wanted to do something, but you haven't done it yet. The first step is to sit at the feet of Jesus. And listen. And if you've been listening tonight, if you've been listening tonight, no, it's the day of preparation. Preparation for the crucifixion of Christ. But it may be your day of preparation to accept Christ. The blood of the Lamb that was shed on the cross for the remission of your sin is available to you today. Do you know him as Lord and Savior? Are you ready to receive him? I want you to bow your heads at this time. I want you to fix your eyes on the Lord. I want you to remember the message of a woman who gave it all. in the face of angry men who 
you could not understand why she did what she did, but to her, it was the most precious and necessary thing to do. And she did it for the Lord. She did it because she could. And nothing stopped her. And she has become a memorial. What will be your memorial? What will your children think? Your future children think? Your future wife? If you're single? Or maybe you're older like me and you haven't lived the life that you know Christ would want you to live and tonight you're willing to break the neck off the bottle and you're willing to give it all for the sake of your loyalty and love of Jesus Christ, your adoration of him. I'd like you to bow your heads now and as we wait upon the Lord and I don't want to rush this moment. The time has come for a decision to be made. As we prepare to to worship God, I would like to ask this question. Two things. One, if you don't know Jesus Christ, would you like to know him tonight as Lord and Savior? The other question, if you've walked away from him and you're here as a in pretense, pretense is a horrible sin. You're pretending. You know you are far from Christ. You've stopped sitting at his feet. But he's drawn you close tonight. And he's spoken to your heart. And you want to share the fragrance of Christ. And it's time to come. And to give him everything. If you want Christ in your life, I'm going to ask the worship team to play. And as they play, I would like to ask you to think, think deeply. Think seriously. Think with no other thought than Christ and what he's done for you. The cross that offers you eternal life. And almost all you must do is believe. Believe and come. Come to the altar. If you want Christ in your life and you've never asked him in your life, it's time. Come. Don't let that seat hold you down. Don't let thinking that you can't do this hold you down because Jesus said you can. Come all of you who are heavy laden and follow me. Come. Stand to your feet and come. And let Christ reign over your life. It's time. If you're not walking with him, come. If you don't know him, come. But come to the altar. And let Christ give you rest. Let it be a relationship and not a religion. Let us worship. Pray for the person next to you if you don't know them. Pray that the Holy Spirit touch lives now and move people to come and to accept Jesus Christ. The most important moment of this evening will be now as those who come will be saved. Come.